I want to help as many people as possible, you know, realize their dreams and get a good job. That's that's what I'm all about, about helping young people as much as I possibly can. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and today I'm joined by Ray Sherry, the esteemed CEO of Zind Limited, an innovative organization dedicated to empowering Gen Z, promoting youth initiatives and fostering an environment free from discrimination and empowering them to be able to develop their careers and find the jobs of their dreams. With an impressive career spanning for four decades across financial services and consulting with a background and focus on technology, Ray has amassed a wealth of experience and insight. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Computing from the prestigious Leicester University. And in 2022, Ray's visionary leadership was recognized with the coveted Best Digital Startup Award, a testament to his exceptional contribution to the digital landscape. Remarkably, Ray's achievements are underscored by his resilience and dedication. In March 2021, he underwent a liver transplant, a life-altering event following a long-standing condition. Profoundly moved by the knowledge that his organ donor was a young man, Ray has since committed himself to a noble cause, helping young people discover and pursue careers that resonate with their unique talents and aspirations. In this episode, Ray and I discuss the genesis of Zind. We talk about the problems with modern day recruitment agencies and the problems that, that young people face in the job market. And we also look behind the scenes of how Zind empowers young people with both training and recruitment possibilities. And we talk about the possible applications for this platform within the architectural space. So sit back, relax and enjoy. Ray Sherry. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. Ray, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm great, Ryan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me along today. My absolute pleasure. Very excited to have you on the show. So a little bit of a different conversation or uh, you're in a, a different field, if you like, to perhaps some of my usual guests. Um, you're the Chief Executive Officer of Zind, which is a staffing and recruitment um, organization, quite an innovative one. Uh, and I, I'm always fascinated with the, with, with the kind of world of recruitment and particularly how it, um, you know, interacts with an industry like architecture. I know architects, you know, in the UK, certainly in the US, in the US, they've been having a real difficult time of recruiting. And the UK, it's been not so bad, but it's certainly, it's still been very, uh, very challenging. And certainly in the world of architecture, bringing on people, the using of recruitment agencies, there's, there's quite a, a, a big mix of them. Uh, and you're, it's not, it's not difficult to find architects complaining about recruitment and, and staffing, either working with agencies or the whole process itself. So welcome to the show. And perhaps you could, um, we could start off by you, you giving us a little bit of, uh, a, a background into how you came to be the CEO of Zind. Sure. It'd be my pleasure. Uh, sort of my career, if you like, just started 40 years ago in technology. Like many students came out of university, got pretty lucky, got into my first job um, quickly and joined um, a, a major bank here in the UK as a, as a software engineer. And I had a very, very um, well-developed career path for the first five to 10 years of, of, my, of my career journey. And from then on, it was more up to me to decide and take control of my career and decide what I wanted to do and how I wanted to, to develop myself over time. And, and I moved around 
to 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 get sort of more experience, try out different skills, uh, work with different people, grow my network, and so forth. And and eventually, I moved into senior positions, uh, both in banking, consultancy, and uh, and then I ended up in the the startup and the growth business industry. Um, as a chief technology officer, so, you know, I, mm-hmm. I did my time in projects. I did my time in service. I did my time in leadership and management and so forth. And eventually found the thing that I really, I really, really enjoyed. But I was always, always harboring ideas about helping people, giving back to society, you know, four decades in tech. And uh, I always felt that I should be giving back. And for, for a number of years, I've been sort of keeping this idea in my head about helping young people, but I wasn't really sure about what I would do and how I would do it. And mm-hmm. then uh, to cut a long story short, in uh, March 2021, at the height of the pandemic here in, in the UK, um, I had a liver transplant. And uh, again, long story short, um, I had been diagnosed 15, 16 years earlier with a, with a rare condition, rare liver disease. And um, we knew that I would need a transplant at some point, but we just weren't sure when that would be. Wow. And uh, I don't, I don't think anyone would pick the middle of a pandemic or the height of a pandemic to have a have a major operation. But that's that's the way. Well, that's, that's scary. The way my cards fell, and and I, and I took it. Yeah, it was very scary. Um, even to the extent that the hospital that had me on their waiting list for a, for a, for an organ had to close for a period of time because of COVID. And uh, I was shifted mm-hmm. around the country uh, into other hospitals and then eventually brought back to the one in London, the, an organization called Royal Free. I hope you don't mind me mentioning them. Uh, they do a brilliant job every single day. No, not day. at all. So, no, go- gosh, yeah, I can so... I just, just only imagine the, the anxiety around that. I mean, it's, it's scary enough just having the liver transport, let alone that, that time in COVID when it was so unknown. Yeah, very much so. The one thing that was really good about the Royal Free Hospital was the fact that uh, the, the the units for transplants were isolated pretty much from everything else. So you right. could walk in one door and never see another person other than the medical team until it was time for you mm. to go for your transplant. Um, so we, we were well protected. I was well protected uh, and didn't have any engagement with anybody else through that whole process and, until until that, that last moment. And And I have to say, you know, Thinking back, and I talk about it quite a lot to people, is that it was very much a spiritual moment, and I'll explain what I mean by that a little bit, a bit later on as well. So I had the transplant, and it went very, very successfully. And uh, literally within a couple of days, I was awake, I was back in a ward, and um, feeling great. You know, the color from my skin had turned from my uh, regular orange color. It looked like it had been in a, a great part of Spain for a number of months. Uh, to a normal <laughs> pinkish color, as, as you might see now. And and that in itself was amazing. Just to have that sense of mm-hmm. looking normal uh, was, was incredible. And, and I have a, I really have a tangerine picture of me stored away in my, my, my photo album, which I sometimes refer to to remind me where I came from. So was it a type of jaundice from... Yes, it was jaundice. Yeah, yeah. Bilirubin, is the, Bilirubin is the actual... Um, protein in the body that uh, causes you to, to turn yellow, orange, basically. My, my bilirubin level was 10 times what it should have been, 10 times. It was wow. dangerous to the point where if the transplant hadn't gone ahead, I was a goner because the bilirubin then begins to muck with the brain and cause, mm-hmm. cause neural problems as a consequence. Wow. I was hanging in there. And thankfully, luckily for me, I, I, had, a, I, had, a, I had a donor at the 11th hour mm-hmm. and I was saved. Unfortunately, my donor died. Um, but he, mm-hmm. he went on to help seven other people with his uh, organ donation, which, which is incredible. You know, the courage of a person to do that is just phenomenal mm-hmm. and to be supported by the family even more so. Two days wow. after the transplant, I found out that my donor was a young man. Um, I know his name. I'm not going to mention his name um, just out of respect to, for his family, etc. But I knew that he was a young man. And it sort of it, it resonated with me that I'd been thinking about helping young people for some time. And here I am, my life saved by a young person. So I thought from that day on, I thought to myself, I need to do something. I need to put my foot forward, my best brain forward. And I need to sort of get on and do something to help young people. So literally within... I think within two days after that, that sort of eureka moment, I decided that I would set up a new company and I would start detailing Zint 
uh, as far as I could, with the view then to um, getting a portal developed and, and getting uh, a load of services for young people developed and, and launched online. And, and that's what I did. That's what I did. And I'm very pleased where, we, where we've got to at this point mm-hmm. in time. And I'm very pleased that I'm now helping uh, hundreds of young people um, in the mm-hmm. memory of, of my donor. Wow. Amazing. Before you had set up Zind, did you need to continue to, to work? I was working continually anyway as an interim chief technology <laughs> officer. I've sort of been fortunate to be able to pick and choose uh, job opportunities mm-hmm. for some time now, given the demands on my particular skill set. So I'd been working as an sure. interim CTO for a while, uh, two days, three days a week, etc. But I knew that to be able to deliver Zend and, and, and really bring it to market, I needed to focus on it. So I, I parked mm-hmm. everything that I was doing with technology and switch my attention to Zind and the technology that was involved in Zind. Right, right. I gotcha. Amazing. So what was the first things that you needed to do to set up the platform? And did you have to work in investors and raise finance? Or how, how did, the, how did the, the, the kind of the technological component develop? And then how did the business component develop? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to use uh, I'm going to use a word that I'm sure you use commonly on on your uh, podcast shows is that I had to architect finding finding uh, investors. So effectively, I had to go to the right forums, the right network meetings, uh, and approach the right people to be able to get investment. And and I secured the investment after three months of looking. Uh, I happened to bump into two people, two very lovely people, at a product event, a software product event in London. They had gone along just out of interest, out of curiosity, and we were just sat next to each other. I mean, next to each other. It was such a coincidence. And we, we, formed, uh, we formed a relationship, and, and literally within three months, the company was set up, the investment was, was in the bank account, and we were up and running. Fantastic. And, and so what was some of the, the innovations or the, the, the thinking behind what you wanted to do with the SIN that makes it different from your usual recruitment um, platforms i don't know what to what extent your 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 followers and your listeners have have themselves um experienced the job market but most people will tell you irrespective of where they are in that journey whether they're new to the market or whether they've been in the market for a number of years um the one thing that comes out consistently loud and clear is the lack of feedback Mm -hmm. and there's lots of reasons why employers or recruiters don't do the feedback the primary one is it takes a lot of time you know you get a thousand people applying for a job and you've only got two jobs that's 999 people that you know are hungry for feedback the the market just doesn't uh, accommodate that type of volume of feedback in a way that is uh, efficient and productive to all parties so that was really number one I think the second the second uh, challenge that we had was that we wanted to create something that was just beyond looking for a job. We wanted to be able to mm-hmm. give young people, in fact, anybody looking for a job, the opportunity to upskill and train and learn and develop whilst they were looking for a job or whilst they were in a job. You know, I, I have huge respect for, for employers and the challenges that they face running, running a business myself. Um, you can't always keep your promises. You can't always deliver the upskilling training courses that that that, that you may mm-hmm. have um, said it one year and taken away the next year. You can't always do that. Things things change. So to to help employers, we wanted to provide the opportunity for their current uh, employees to be able to join Zint and take advantage of all the training courses that we have online, even if they're not looking for a job. And uh, we've managed to do that. We have access to 14,000 training courses online, uh, many of which are accredited through our training partner. Mm -hmm. That was the second thing. Yeah, I think the third thing was um, the market is very uh, resume or CV dependent heevily. I mean, this is a this is a process that's been running for decades and it's still based Mm -hmm. on paper primarily. And, And I know there have been 
innovations within the marketplace around AI and around um, workflow and automation, but we're fundamentally mm -hmm. still working off a paper format, a PDF or a Word document. So we wanted to challenge that. We wanted to move away from paper. We wanted to be able to move to effectively a data-driven solution. And because we, because we use data, we can, we can match people with the requirements of employers much more quickly. We can do it literally within a few seconds, a few milliseconds. And that allows us at the same time to provide instant feedback to the, uh, to the job seeker as well. That changes the dynamics. What? That changes what, what we can now do with that data. And, you know, I, I think it's quite interesting when I speak to a lot of, I mean, primarily I speak to a lot of employers about hiring and how expensive it is, how long it takes. Certainly now in, in the architecture industry, um, it's becoming ever increasingly more challenging there's a distrust of recruiting agencies or some of the old uh kind of mm. classic recruitment agencies the amount of money that it costs to hire somebody and then you have all these kinds of iffy practices where the recruiter is um you know on the one hand bringing you in employees and then on the other hand they're courting your staff to entice them out and to you know palm them off to another another company, if you like. I mean, I've heard so many stories of that, that there's there's been a lot of, uh, certainly within architects, I don't know what it's like in other industries, but I would imagine there's a, a similar sort of complaint. There's a there's a distrust with the recruitment, recruitment world. And the, I guess the other part of it is that the kind of level of transparency and how the mechanisms and, uh, are working and also the, you know, the, the making sure it's a right fit. So that, again, that would be another kind of complaint that I hear from architects telling me about recruitment agencies is that the the fit doesn't seem right. Or, you know, we've been given somebody who's, you know, after a few months, it doesn't work out. How, how does Zind kind of navigate some of that complexity? I mean, I alluded, I alluded to the fact that that we use data-driven profiles. So we're, we're, mm -hmm. we're driving the matching process, you know, the, almost the, 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 the dating type process in the background through data. And we're using criteria mm -hmm. that's set by the employer and the same skills taxonomy is you use by our members or by our, our Zindites as we call them. So because mm -hmm. we're using the same language, we can match in, in a common way. So when an employer says, I want, three people with these skills, we've got people on the other side who are showing on their profile that they've got those skills. Uh, and we verify them. We actually verify the skills because we, we do insist on putting people through a certain amount of training so that they can at least say that they've been through some sort of development to attain that skill, even though they may not have practiced it um, very widely. That's why they need to work. But at least we've given them some sort of foundation in problem solving. So you're in a right, world yeah. where that's, that's going like this. It's just completely mismatching all the time. So we needed to simplify that, first of all. And we needed to say, oh, how much data do we need to be able to match a person with an employer? Now, by matching, by matching skills, we're increasing the likelihood that an employer will find the right person and that the employer will mm -hmm. then be able to keep that person with better retention over time. It's not as simple as saying, I'll just match with that person and they're going to be the perfect employee and never leave us. That employee is still going to want the upskilling, the developments, the career path planning, and so forth. Uh, and that's why mm -hmm. we, we wanted to help the employers further by giving them the option, yeah, recruit through Zend, find the right people, but also use Zend to be able to take advantage of the training that's available. It won't cost you anything because that's paid mm -hmm. for by the member effectively, you know? Do, do, do employers still put out like a job application or a job notice, if you like, and then, and then people are browsing? Or is it more that, um, you know, once there are two active users on the platform, the system is kind of linking them up together and it's kind of like, look at this person, and it's more like a matchmaking type of tool? How, how does it work from the side yeah, of the like, employer? 
Yeah, so so the employer has two options for finding uh, the right people or the right person. They can create a job post mm -hmm. in, in a sort of a more traditional way, um, and they can submit that job post into a job board, which is internal to the Zin platform. Um, we help them with creating that job post because we provide them with the skills for the particular role that they're looking for. So if they put in their software engineer trainee, we'll provide them from our database the skills that supports that role. Okay, so They don't really have to do an awful lot. They may want to add more in terms of roles and responsibilities to that description. Um, but once they've done that and they put the closing date in, like a, like a normal job post, submit it, it appears to the, to the Zin world, to the Zin Club world. So everyone who's looking for that type of job will, will actually see it. So that's the first way they can do it. So they're familiar with that approach. And also our members are familiar with that approach as well. The second feature that we give the employers is a direct talent pool search. So it, and this mm -hmm. is replicating what recruitment agencies have. So when a recruitment agency gets right. a brief from an employer or a client, what they'll do is they'll, they'll set that criteria up on their database search and they'll run that search and that will find as many matching people as, as there is on their database. We're giving the employer that feature, that facility, so they can do the talent search themselves. The end result is the same. So on the on the job post, people apply. So it's a, it's a, it's what we call a pull. Um, on the talent mm -hmm. search, it's it's actually a, a push type um, feature. And there are subtle differences between the two in the sense that when someone applies for a job, they're effectively giving their right for you to access their information as long as you pay the fees. When it's mm -hmm. uh, an employer approaching someone through a talent search, we actually have to comply with the data privacy regulations uh, and ask mm -hmm. the member, are they, are they willing to give consent to talk with that employer? Okay, so oh, we have quite, to, you know, we have to stay on the yeah. right side of the law. Yeah, we have to treat, treat them as if we were marketing to them uh, and ask for explicit mm -hmm. consent every single time, basically. So yeah, the employer's got two, one feature that they're really familiar with in terms of job posts and job board markets, and the, um, and the one that they, they will not be given by a recruitment agency is the direct talent search. And all of that, all of that, both on the employer side and on the member side, um, is is effectively summarized through a dashboard that the member has. They can see it. Amazing. So when the employer is doing the talent search, are, are they looking through effectively anonymous profiles? So you, they don't know the, the kind of personal details of the individual, but they're looking at the skill sets and the talents and the experience, and and then they can kind of earmark. You know what this guy looks or this lady looks amazing. And then they can send a message, and then if the and if that person wants to get in contact or have further details released of them, that that's what happens. That's exactly how, does the how talent it works. Search? Yeah, we give the we give the um, we give the members all of our young people, anyone that signs up to to Zin Club, we give them uh, a Zindite name. It's a unique name to them, um, which keeps them anonymous in terms of their private information. Mm -hmm. And it's only when the employer gets that consent, well, we actually, and then pay the online fee that we, we levy with them, will they actually get the ability to connect. So we have to protect, we have to protect the young people um, from uh, effectively being bombarded by employers. Um, so that's why we ask for consent, but it is also a legal requirement to do that. I gotcha. I gotcha. That that in itself, yeah, is very is very innovative. How many um, users do you have at the moment, and which kinds of industries are you finding are using the platform the most, or do you think could benefit from the platform the most? Well, so we launched in pays? March. So actually, both parties pay. So the member pays and right. the employer pays typically, but because mm -hmm. we launched in March, we're offering membership for free to the to mm -hmm. the to the young people so they can join without any barriers whatsoever and we will continue to do that for 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 as long as we can sustain that as such uh, but eventually we expect to be able to levy a fee to to the members because they'll see the mm -hmm. value in what they're getting uh, an infinite list of training career path planning access to jobs employability tracking industry information there's a whole range of things App, you know just getting the feedback is invaluable 
to to members because they don't get that from anywhere else today. Nowhere provides feedback other than Zint. So, so the types of so we've got uh, hundred and so we started in March, quite March, quite April. Boom! We then went and spent some time with the university. Uh, we got fifty members literally that day joined up, signed up. Uh, we've now trebled that uh, in in um, in June. And the, the trend we see already, because we get people uh, contacting us, is that we will probably double that again in, in July as we go forward. The sorts of roles that are particularly interesting to people is mostly around technology at the moment. We get some creative industry, which is around things like podcasting, things like um, film production, gaming, that type of thing. We get some interest around that as well, but it's mostly technology. Technology is the most active field an industry when it comes mm-hmm. to young people at the moment they're all looking for technology related jobs it's uh it's incredible even if someone's done geography or history they're looking for something to get them into technology um and we see that we see that yeah, very we, very clearly we have yeah we have about 35 individual technology roles at three levels on the platform mm-hmm. uh, and obviously we're looking at entry level for 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 students and graduates so so you'll see more entry level roles but there are there are signs that we need to be moving into the green skills space. So we need to mm-hmm. be creating opportunities within sustainability, within environmental roles, within water utilities, this type of thing as well. And that's where the trends are going. Electric vehicles is another one um, where there's a growing demand. It's very interesting, actually. We, we see a lot of um architects migrating from the architectural profession into technology and um a lot of uh, a lot of software companies are often interested in some of the skill sets of of architects or architecture graduates just the kind of creative skill sets i mean architects these days are coming out and they can code and they've got a, an understanding in electrical engineering and they've been building things that have got integrated um you know software into them um and the kind of architectural mindset if you like of being able to go from big picture to very small detailed can be quite useful there's a lot of parallels there with um in in software we're starting to see a lot of that kind of you know um movement between the industry which i think is very very uh it's very good, very encouraging. You mentioned as well that this training component of Zind. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and, the, and your training partner and what sorts of trainings are provided? Yes. So all of the training. So one of the things that one of the things that we that we really wanted to do, as I mentioned before, we wanted to move away from the the sole use of a, a CV or a resume. Okay. So. We only use the CV for lifting existing information uh, from it for, as far as we can, uh, but we also we also use it for finding skills that that are written into that CV, and we use that those skills that we find to match with our taxonomy. Someone might put good at communication, but in our taxonomy, it might mm. say communications. So we will substitute that word with communication so that we're matching at a, at a, at a like for like basis. So one of the things that we've identified from the research that, that we carried out uh, as we were going through the process of setting Zind up was that what are employers looking for? What, what, are the, what are the skills that they want that young people are not getting as they come out of university? So we identified 12 soft skills that were coming up regularly from employers, from market research that employers were looking for, but young people did not have. So we provide 12 essential soft skills training and it's front and center on the homepage of every member's uh, login. They get the, the what we call the Zin training courses uh, and they can just sort of page through, scroll through each one and take each one in turn, whatever, whatever order they want. And it includes things like communications, problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, creative problem solving, team working, time management, negotiation, conflict management. So all of the things that, you know, more experienced people would probably just take for granted, e- even though I know that a lot of experienced people haven't even been through that themselves such. So we provide that essential training. Now, what does that do? That immediately gives anyone that takes that training uh, a head start against people that don't have those, those skills or that particular training knowledge, okay? So that's, that's key. So that immediately gives them a jump start on anybody else that's not on the Zen platform. The, the second thing that we provide mm-hmm. is um, 
a career path. What we can, what we do is that we, we ask the member, where are you starting from? Okay, I'm a student, a full-time student, and I've got this degree. Where do you want to go? Okay, so we ask them, what is the next step that you want to take? Okay, I want to become a, a, a trainee software, software engineer. Python, for example, is a, is, a, is a language. We then tell them what the skills are that they need to attain to make that step. Okay, and we put that into a, a, a visual roadmap on the screen. As they mm -hmm. click on each skill that they need to attain, we, we split soft skills on the left, technical skills on the right. As they click on each one, they'll be presented with a, a lookup for a training course that matches that skill. And usually, 99% of the time, the first skill that appears on that list or first training course that appears on that list will be the one that they need to take to be able to attain that particular skill. So we work with a training partner called Allison. They're an Irish-based company. They're based in Cork, who have a philosophy of providing training to people for free, basically. And we mm -hmm. echo that. We, 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 we meet that requirement because we're not charging people for training. We're not charging people for applying for jobs, et cetera. We're providing them with a whole range of different services that when you put it all together, we can put a little price on that package as such. Okay. So mm -hmm. the sorts of training that's then available is, is huge. It's everything from, um, I, I know plumbing, learn about plumbing online. I know you can't learn about all plumbing online, but you can learn some of the theory online. Nursing. Um, you can learn about engineering, you can learn about uh, technology, you can learn all of the major software languages, you can become a DevOps engineer, you can become a business analyst. It's, it's a huge range of job opportunities. I think when, the last time I looked, there was something like 800 different types of career that were supported through training uh, with our training partner. So it's a, it's a vast array. Uh, most of those training courses are accredited through our training partner as well. So if you if you take the uh, training course, you pass the training course, you can then you can also get a certificate to confirm that you've taken it as well. Brilliant. That's are um, you working with I mean, uh... language? Sorry, I was just going to mention the languages as well. There is a huge demand uh, for English language. We get mm -hmm. a lot of we get a lot of uh, international students. Um, who have already landed in the UK that want to learn and improve their English. And our training partner provides, I think it's 12 different English languages courses from A1 through to, I think it's B3 level, which is expert mm -hmm. level, uh, with all the accreditations in between as well. And we, I think there's 64 different languages that we can provide online. So if you want to learn Spanish and you're English, English fluent, you want to improve your holiday uh, um, language, you can do that through Zing Club. You don't, you don't have to go anywhere else. It's all there in one place. Well, maybe I'll sign up for that, improve my Spanish. <laughs> maybe you should. That, that, that's, quite, that's quite incredible. That's actually, you know, because it's actually, you know, there as a resource for, for people as opposed to simply just finding work, actually training people up. Have you started working with architects yet? Do you have many architecture clients or you or what, or what parts of the construction industry are you working with or have you seen take yeah. take uh, start to utilize Zind? yeah we haven't yet gone into the architecture industry as yet we are in the architecture of technology and like like you right. mentioned earlier on there is a there is a beautiful crossover between architecture in um let's say building services um, the other way, mm -hmm. it's not so easy, I think, from an, a technology perspective to go into the, to the business of architecture itself, uh, but it, it works well mm -hmm. the other way. And we, are seeing, we are seeing an in increasing set of requests for building services and product design mm -hmm. from an engineering perspective. A number of members have joined and said, you know, uh, when are you going to be able to offer opportunities in that space? And, it, and it's a gradual uh, organic growth thing. You know, as we as we work with employers, the employers give us the job opportunities, then we can post them or they can sort of the employers will post the jobs um, and then begin to look for those people. It doesn't stop us from helping people who are sort of in between. Like there's one was one guy in particular who joined who joins in club um, recently and he took advantage of the Zin coach facility. We offer a coaching facility as well. Um, which is which is which is included in what we do. Uh, it's, it's not an additional service that we offer and then charge, you know, extortionate fees. We don't do that. We it's there to help 
people make the right career choices. So they can they can book a session with a Zen coach, thirty minutes at a time. It's, in, it's not included, uh, and then we can work with them to build um, a Zen career action plan. It's effectively a tool that they can use to really bring focus to their job hunting. So in this particular guy, he uh, he wanted to become a product engineer, and uh, we talked it through. We put together the career path plan for him um, offline because it's a coaching career path plan, but which he needs the action in full. And, and he's very happy. He's working through that. Uh, and it's and it's really helping him. And, and it's not rocket science. If you're interested in three or four particular companies and you're interested in a particular type of role, you need to just research those companies. You need to reach out to those companies. Uh, you need to follow those companies, really get to understand a little bit about them. Put all of this in your action plan so you remember what you've already done. And, and then you can document the next step. So we're using that offline tool as a, as a coaching aid to help people that are sort of sat in between at the moment. But it is coming. Mm. It is coming. We will be introducing new industries over time. Amazing. Well, I would, I'd love to encourage our aud- audience here of architecture practice owners to um, reach out to you and Zind and to start utilizing a platform like this. I think that would be... A- very well needed for the architecture industry. If people want to engage with Zind or interact with it or see what the, the platform is about, what's the best way for them to be able to do that? Uh, best way is just to go to our portal. The URL for the portal, the web address for the portal is uh, zindplatform.com, Z-Y-N-D platform.com, basically. Just go there and, and follow follow what's on the screen. If, uh, if anyone wants to contact me directly, uh, just write to ray at zind.co.uk and just just state what you're asking i'm a very accessible very open person i want to help as many people as possible you know realize their dreams and get a good job that's that's what i'm all about about helping helping young people as much as i possibly can and if i have to give stuff away to make that happen then i will do it it's as simple as that we're in a world that's very challenging today um there is a lot Mm -hmm. of information out there for young people to to pick and um, and select. Um, sometimes they just need to be focused on doing the right things in the right order, and and they'll get results as a consequence of that. And I'm I'll even uh, I'll even throw in uh, some free memberships for your your followers and your listeners as well, uh, Ryan. And I quite happily offer two hundred free memberships through through your podcast wow. to anyone that wants to take advantage of uh, of Zing Club for the next year. And I'll, I'll wow, email you the uh, special code. I'll email you a special code that, so uh, that people can use. Amazing. That's, a, that's very, very generous. Well, well, we'll put all this information into the, into the podcast um, details on the platform. So if you're listening to this Fantastic. and you're driving in the car at the moment, make sure that you, you pull over immediately and copy and paste the, the links. But Ray, that, <laughs> that's a perfect place to conclude the conversation. Very generous of you today with that and also with your, your time and just telling us a, you know, your amazing story and all about Zind. Thank you so much. Thank you very much as well, uh, Ryan. It's been a great pleasure talking with you, and uh, I hope we can do it again. Let's say in a year's time or nine months' time, whenever whenever it feels right, and uh, hopefully I'm giving you numbers in the thousands and uh, we're changing lives. That makes me very proud of what we're doing. I love it. I would love to do that. And that's a wrap. And one more thing. If you haven't already, please do head on over to iTunes or Spotify and leave us a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show and we'd love to get your feedback and we'd love to hear what it is that you'd like to see more of and what you love about the show already. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. 
The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.